Here is the underlying principle for exhaustion. The first answer that someone gives you is never everything they know. By the way, this applies to life in general. <laughs> Girlfriends, spouses, employers, the first answer they give you is not everything they know. Welcome to Bad Law, Worst Facts. My name is Michael Tappa. Today I have Philip Miller on. He is a co-author of Advanced Depositions, and he does cases all across the nation and uh, doesn't really have a, a, a specific discipline. I mean, you've, you've, we were talking off air earlier, you do medical malpractice to trucking cases. Um, and it sounds like, from what I understand, it's, it's really the principles, the mechanics of everything are close to the same. It's just about what facts, what you need. Um, Mr. Miller, how are you doing today? Philip, I'm doing fine, Michael. <laughs> uh, Philip, tell me a little bit about your, your book. I mean, I've read it. I love it. It, it, talk, it gives you really, it's some of those philosophical books, right? There's some books out there that say you should talk about damages and you should get the witness or get some witnesses to talk about your client's damages. Your, yours is, you know, here is, for example, the boxing method. Here's exhaustion. Here's a restate and summarize method. And you give examples of how to do this in depositions. Uh, what made you want to write the book? Well, I didn't really want to write the book. <laughs> <laughs> because I had a pretty good idea of how much work it would be. Uh, and uh, I was asked to write the book by uh, some of the um, professional staff at AAJ because I had been teaching and been a principal for the Advanced Deposition College that AAJ does every January in New Orleans. And so because I'd been the course advisor for that program so many times, along with my a good friend, Paul Scopter, they asked the two of us to write this book. And uh, and it was, you know, and fine. So then we kind of got into it. And everything that's in the book are things that we teach at the Advanced Deposition College. So it, it is actually the, the, um, the text for AAJ's Advanced Deposition College, because that is the resource for people who want to learn these techniques. And by coming to the college, what happens is they actually get to practice them, right? Yeah. And, and we actually cover things that aren't necessarily in the book, but really are sort of advanced concepts for deposition technique. So it's all about strategy and technique. Um, the thing that I do offline when I'm, when I'm, when I'm hired by people, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll do stuff on technique, but most of it's about strategies, asking the right question. And so part of what the book focuses on is, what do you need to be talking about with this witness? And then how do you ask them? And because the, I, I, I was mentoring a younger lawyer not long ago, and they say, what do I ask? And that's, that's a fundamental question. But the answer is, of course, the more you've done it, the more simple it is, or it should be. And the answer is for that person is like, what do you have to prove? Right. That's what you need to be asking about. <laughs> Uh, yeah. and, and then depending on what that is, then your strategy and tactics sort of evolve from that. But what do you need to prove? That tells you what you need to ask, how you need to ask it, the kind of questions you're going to use, as well as anticipating where's going to be evasion. How can I go around the evasion? You know, who, is the, who are the witnesses I need to talk to? Uh, and so, for example, if you don't understand that if you're suing a company, and most of the time we are suing companies as opposed to individuals, we're not going to get binding testimony just because somebody's an employee. We have to do a 30B6 deposition or a corporate representative deposition to get binding testimony. So do we want to waste all our good shots on some underlings so they're prepped on all our best shots and all our techniques? No, probably not. Right? We right. want to find a person who can give binding testimony that's going to allow us to win our case. That's going to be the corporate rep, and we want to go after that. But that leads me into a whole other thing, is which is, what are you going to ask them? And so you see people all online, and this is one of my pet peeves. Does anybody have a sample notice of deposition for a, a trucking safety director? <laughs> Which is really, that is very uninformed and ignorant because it depends on what your case is. The right. fact that someone has someone something that they use doesn't mean it applies to you. Doesn't it mean it applies to your case or what's really important in your case. So you have to think through all of that stuff. There's no outline that can think through it for you. You have to think through what's important in my case. What can I prove to this witness? What's important to prove to this witness? As opposed to let me just take this thing and 
acting like it's just a, you know, a, a perfunctory, you know, list with check boxes on it that you might get from somebody. It's not that. It's the strategy of your deposition. It's the strategy of your case. And so look, the, the number one thing I hope that people get out of is not only basic techniques that make depositions easier for you, but the whole fact that you've got to have some strategy for why you're taking this deposition to begin with. And if you can't figure out what that is, then you shouldn't take it. Yeah, 100%. And you've got to be uh, very conscious about what depositions you're taking because, first of all, they're not free. <laughs> uh, and, and second, you have to always think about what do you want to show at trial and how do you get there? And a lot of times you don't have to let, you can't let the witness leave um, before you've gotten everything you need, whether it's for a discovery purpose or whether it's for you need to get some sort of admission. And that kind of leads me into one of the things that you talk about is exhaustion. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Exhaustion is, the, here is the underlying principle that, that for, for exhaustion. The first answer that someone gives you is never everything they know. By the way, this applies to life in general. <laughs> Girlfriends, spouses, employers. The first answer they give you is not everything they know, which means you've got to ask for more. So exhaustion is about, okay, you ask them the open-ended question and they answer it. Is that everything they know? No, it's never everything they know. So this applies to voir dire as well. You ask a question, they answer it. Is that everything they know? No, you've got to, you better have to initiate technically what's called a probe, which is just what else? Yeah. Tell me more. Go on. Those are examples of three probes to elicit additional testimony on that point. Now, do you have to do that with everything that comes out of someone's mouth? Of course not. But if you're in a substantive area of the case where what they say, or what they remember, or what they believe is important, you ask them the question, even if you get a fulsome answer, you should say, what else? And when they say, that's it, there's nothing else, when they essentially cry uncle, now you're done with them, right? You're done on that question. You've got everything. Now you can box them in after that, or you can do whatever you want to do. But the bottom line is, if it's a, you're in a substantive area of the deposition, you have to exhaust. So if it was a, if it was a um, fact witness in a collision, and you say, what did you see? Open-ended question, that's fair, right? And they say, blah, blah, blah. And you say, what else? And they answer and say, tell me more. Go on until they say, that's it. I got nothing else. And then you go into some other area of inquiry, which is whatever it might be. Right. But the answer is the first answer. Not everything they know. You've got to exhaust, which is just, this is like, I mean, I've seen people who have deposition outlines that will go into some area where they have pages and pages and pages. Yeah. You don't need to figure out every question because what you want to do is they ask the fundamental question listen to it, and you're probably going to make a decision if it's a substantive area to say, exhaust, what else? Tell me more. And the, the other thing that's going on there is there's this whole thing called cognitive load. Now, you didn't used to like that term because it sounded really kind of snooty. But if that cognitive load is how hard are you having to think? And part of the techniques we teach at advanced deposition colleges, it's not about how hard we have to think. We want to shift the cognitive load to the witness. So it's how hard they have to think. Because if they're having to think hard, they're less likely to lie. So when, so when they say something, the, our goal is always to say, let's get something out there right away. And the easiest thing is when they answer a question and we're exhausting them, they answer it and they think, okay, now I'm off the hook now. And you say, what else? And you do that every time so they know you're potty training them, essentially. So they know that if they give you every answer they have, they might as well give you the complete answer. Right. Because you're just going to hammer on them until you get it anyway. Right. So that's, exha that's exhaustion. It's a great technique. It's simple to use if you just get out of the way and don't say, don't say what else about. Just say what else. Now, here's the reason why. People say, but I want them to go right here. It's like, you do. But that doesn't mean that's leading to the maximum amount of information you can get from this witness. When you say what else, it's non-threatening. You're not directing them to some sort of trick question. They get to decide exactly what that means and where to go with it. 
And they'll end up talking about things that you would never think of asking because you weren't being directive. You're just saying, what else? Tell me more. And you're exhausted, exhausted until you, you've got everything they can possibly have to say. And, and I'm assuming you use exhaustion to set up what you put in the book as boxing, right? So now you're... Boxing in? Yeah, boxing in is just, let's say that you're in a critical area of the testimony and they've just given you what you think is really important testimony that you want to make sure they don't get, they don't change. Right. Like the lawyer after the deposition said, oh, no, 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 no. We're going to have to file a, 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 a we're going to have to file a notes to the end of your deposition. So, you know, this is, I misstated this. This isn't what I meant. Yeah. You know, and then, when they go to sign, answers. all of a sudden there's all these amendments and they're changing all their answers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And well, technically they probably can't do that. The answer is yeah. we want to make it impossible for them to change their answer. Now, you would say, the traditional way to approach that, well, we'll just impeach him. Mr. Smith, you remember when we took your deposition on February 15th. It was at your lawyer's office. It's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I asked you this question. I'll read you this question right here. Blah, 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 blah. And here's the answer. You can read it too. What was your answer then? Boom. So you've impeached them, right? Because they, right. they just give you a contrary answer. Okay. What does that mean? The answer is, well, lawyers think impeachment's really important, right? But, the, but there's no lawyers on a jury. And jurors, generally impeachment, it just doesn't, it, unless they think the person is a complete piece of shit, pardon me, or a liar, yeah. impeachment's not going to get you anywhere. So like, okay, well, he made a mistake, big deal. You know, you shouldn't be able to stomp all over this guy because this witness made this mistake. He was nervous, blah, 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 blah. Right. So what boxing in does is we know that just impeachment by itself is not enough. Right. It's not enough to it's not enough for a jury to easily conclude that this person is just trying to avoid telling the truth. We don't want the jury to believe that they're a liar or they're a fraud, just that they're not telling the truth or they've got a lousy recollection of facts, because here's what this lawyer asked him at the time. And so in boxing in, there's three categories of information that people get get from the world around. I mean, there may be if they're going to change their testimony. They either have to learn new facts or acquire new facts because they've already testified to something. Now, if they acquire new facts, okay, maybe they can change their testimony. Or maybe they see a document of kind, a collision report, a medical record. They see some document that allows them to change their testimony. Or maybe they talk to somebody who's a witness or an expert or anybody else, and that causes them to change their testimony. So boxing in is we eliminate the universe of excuses they would have for changing their testimony or try to. And what it does, instead of just a one-question impeachment, gives us a whole series of questions. So it's like Mr. Smith sitting here today. Can you think of anybody that if you speak to him after today would cause you to change your sworn testimony that you just gave me, that blah, 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 whatever it is. And if they say maybe, what do we do? We exhaust. <laughs> we, don't have, we, don't have to, we don't have to think of the question. We exhaust. Oh, tell me more. Yeah. What else? And, and, and then we, and we, so we nail down and exhaust anybody that if they talk to them after today might cause them to change their sworn testimony on that point. We're happy, right? We've eliminated yeah. all those people. So, okay, Mr. Smith, thank you for sharing that. So with Mr. Smith, Mr. Jones, Mr. Williams, if you spoke to them after today might cause you to change your sworn testimony, blah, 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 blah whatever it is. It says, okay, can you think? of any document, any piece of paper, or a photograph, a medical record, a collision report, anything that if you looked at it after today might cause you to change your sworn testimony. And they say, oh, I can't think of any, which is typically the answer you get. Right. Right, so now, instead of impeachment, we've got this guy saying, I, can't, I can only name three people that could cause me to change my testimony. I can't think of any single document. Right? He says, okay, so can you think of any fact that if you learned it after today could cause you to change your sworn testimony that blah, 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 blah? Yes, no, what would it be? Tell me more. Go on. Exhaust. So what, at the end of the day, now you've taken them through, instead of one question for impeachment, you've taken them through 10 questions and eliminated any possibility that they could rationally change what they just said under oath was the truth. That's a piece. Now, do you want to do that with every question? Yes, no. But if it's really important, right? Yeah, you probably want to. You probably want to box them in. There's other ways to box them. That technique I just talked about was called 
FW, four-wheel drive, fax, witnesses, and documents. Any fax, any witnesses, any documents that can cause you change your testimony. But you, of course, you do those one at a time. Now we've got a whole series of things. If he changes his testimony, it's like, well, how can a jury can say, he asked him if there was any witness he could think of that could cause him to, and he couldn't come up with anybody. Now he's saying there's somebody. He got a better shot of impeaching the person or, or having the jury come to a conclusion about that witness that they're less credible than they should be. Yeah. So that's, that's forward. The other one is the obvious stuff. Have you told me everything? You know, is there anything you haven't told me? Is that everything you know? You know that kind of stuff, which is okay. Uh, I like the other technique a little better because we, we, we pretty much nail down everything. But the point is, if you've got something important in terms of testimony and witness, you want to make it very difficult for them to change their testimony. Now, does this apply to professional witnesses? You know, the answer is there are some professional witnesses that we have very, uh, we have we have names for them that I probably don't want to use on a podcast. <laughs> but for most witnesses who want to be honest and don't want to be made a fool of, all right, we're gonna get we're gonna get truthful answers for them. But for anybody else, we want to box them in. So you 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 make it's a it is a seat of the, it is from the seat of your pants tactical decision whether you want to box a witness in on a particular thing. But if it's a case critical issue, the answer is yes. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they, 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 they may, if case critical issue, you probably want to box them in on the response. Uh, and there's it's, there may be exceptions to that, but that's the decision you make in the moment or when you're thinking about this deposition in the context of the entire case. So boxing is important to do. And you just have to know that uh, you limit it to what's really important in the case. You don't box them in on where they went to high school. <laughs> as, as an example. <laughs> well, let me ask you. So there, there's some things that I get away from your, uh, I get from your book. And the number one thing, and I don't even know, I don't remember if you say it or not, but it, it's really harped in the book. Just uh, is is that you cannot go into depositions with just a simple outline and say, this is what I'm going to ask. You really need to sit with the witness, whatever witness it is, so that you can use these techniques and master these techniques, right? Um, and, you know, for any lawyer out there, I geared towards young lawyers, but honestly, any lawyer, because we all want to be better in our depositions. What, what tools, what tactics are you doing before the deposition to get ready and say, okay, I want to think about the exhaustion method, the boxing method, and, um, and how, how I do that? Well, you, you have to be, we all have to be masters of the facts. And so part of the preparation is be, being a master of the facts. That's fine. But yeah. we can get into the weeds on the facts. Yeah. And we can think about all kinds of facts that really don't mean anything in terms of what's going to happen in the case. And so we, that says, what is our strategy for this case? How does this witness fit into our strategy? And so it's always, what can I get from this witness that helps me prove a prima facie case? Because the answer is, what do you want to prove with every witness? Well, a prima facie case or some element of a prima facie case is what you want to prove. <laughs> and so the first part is, well, what can I get from this person? You know, and the answer is, and the thing that most people forget about as an example is, remember, part of a prima facie case is damages, right? So you're deposing all of these people and you're worrying about liability, liability, liability. You can ask them damages questions. And they're usually not prepared for it. And it gives you something that, no, it can't. It's going to help. And I, I, by the way, I, I'll say this with regard to experts, too. Experts are there. They want to talk about what they want to talk about. Do you want to talk about what they want to talk about? Probably not. But if you're in a position where you're deposing an expert, you should consider deposing them on damages. Now, how long? Well, just I don't know. It depends on the case. Right. But if they're going to concede something that is really helpful in terms of damages, then you should get it from them. Can you, can you, I'm sorry, can you give me an example of that? An easy example is a birth trauma case, right? So there's going to be doctors on the other side. There's always doctors on the other side. Absolutely. And whatever the plaintiff's doctor says, they said did not, would not, could not, um, or this, the, the, the injury is not related to the trauma, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you're not going to shift them off their opinions. No. No. <laughs> no. If, if, if you think, if you think you have the capability to convince them that they're wrong about their opinion, then you probably need to look for a career in transactional law. It's not, it's not, it's it's not, not going to happen. happen. It's not going to happen. But you can say, you know, 
Doctor, would you agree that uh, a baby who has a birth injury of this kind is going to require intensive therapy and care for the rest of its life? Do you care what they say? No. I mean, they're going to, the answer is they're going to say yes most of the time because that's not in the report. So the answer is you don't want to ask them anything in the report. Anything that's in their report, they're just going to take it and stick it where the sun don't shine, right? Right. So don't ask them about their report. But you can ask them about these other things. The damage is one of the things. It's like, ask them about the damages because I don't care what their answer is. And their answer is exactly. usually usually going to be, uh, yes, I do. I just don't think that the doctor was negligent, blah, blah, blah. And you say, objection, not responsive after, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, or actually, what, what you do is repeat the question. It's like, would you, would you agree that having a baby like this in your household is going to be exhausting for the parents in terms of the requirements for their attention and personal care. Well, I don't know. You don't know? You, again, it's, now you can play with them if they say they don't know. But the answer is, it's okay if they don't know because they look like, you know, yeah. assholes. <laughs> so the answer is, ask, there's, what, what, do you, what do you want to ask is important. And one of the things people could ask about is you can ask about damages, right? But you want to ask you want to ask about what do you have to prove for a prima facie case that includes damages among other things, right? But you can also say other things. Would it be wrong for a doctor to ignore when a nurse tells him about the about the condition of a patient? I don't care what they say. No. Yes. Yeah. Right. It's okay. So those are examples. What's what? What is this? What do you? Why are you taking this person? What can you get them that's going to help you prove your case? That's what you have to think about in advance. This is not a, um, let me ask, let's, let me find out just a bunch of different facts. It's like, where, so what? Where are we getting with all this stuff? Right. And so, and so and the other thing is, is that, for example, I just worked on a case today where a deposition is coming up next week. And I said, do we have a timeline for this? Because it was complicated enough. The timeline shows the jury Here's where it begins and here's where it ends. And look at all this time in between. I mean, they weren't doing anything, right? Yeah. That's the time. It's, it's a takeaway. They look at it and they say, oh, they dropped the ball here. That's what I want jurors to conclude on their own without me saying it. So it took us a while. It was the first timeline. They had nine points on it. Well, that's too many. It's clustered. It's too confusing. We cut it down to five. We look at the timeline and say, oh, they waited too long. Yeah. But the deposition hadn't happened yet. So I said, okay, what we want to do is we want to make sure that the doctor admits each one of these times and a brief summary about that time on the timeline in their deposition. So now when we create the timeline, we can meet any objection as to admissibility of the timeline itself. Because we have admission as to the time, the time and the categorization of what happened at that time through the sworn testimony of the defendant. That's an example of that's thinking ahead a little bit, but it's a real it's it, it's it is the kind of thing that allows a deposition to be outcome determinative, and that's that's the goal. It's like I'm gonna just here's the people stand around and bullshit about how they love to go to trial, blah 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 blah, and it is great being in the courtroom with a jury. I mean, a lot of us are just national performers; we love it, but it's a pain in the ass to get there, right? <laughs> And there's a lot of anxiety and uncertainty and all that kind of stuff. And the answer is, if we can crush them in depositions and settle the case for value, that's really the better thing to do. But that means you've got to put enough time into your deposition that it really is an outcome determinative deposition, which means not four or five hours, not 10 or 15 hours. It may be 30. If it's a, if it's a 30 B6 witness in a case, it's a big case, and you think you have a chance to basically flip the liability aspect of this in a way that is going to make them very uncomfortable. If you have to spend 40 hours in it, so what? Yeah. That's nothing. How much time do you can spend, spend getting ready for trial? Hundreds of hours. So the answer is, and in, in, a, in a case where you want to make a real difference with a witness and, and make it an outcome determinative deposition, then you have to put the time. In. It's not pick up the file the night before and read it and go ahead and start asking questions. No, I mean, I think you have to, exactly what you said, be the master of the facts. Um, you've got to feel comfortable so that way, when you ask the question, um, you are in the driver's seat. You can't do that if you just picked up the file the night before and you're still trying to learn the facts as you're asking the question. It's not going to be helpful. Right. 
right? Right. And, and the best of all worlds is when you can spin the response in advance where you don't really care what they say. If you can take this, you don't really care what they say. That's the best of all possible worlds, because they're not going to they're not going to be cooperative and they're not going to agree with you on anything of substance, probably. But you can put them put them in a position where the question and the answer. When you ask a question, here's the thing to think about. When you ask a question to someone and there's 12 people sitting over here waiting to hear the answer, they answer the question in their head before the person ever gets the words out of their mouth. So I want to ask the question in such a way that they answer the word question in their answer in their heads. And whatever the witness says, if it's inconsistent, they don't believe the witness now. The witness is incredible. I've won on that question no matter what they say. Because they, it was a question where there's really only one or two possible responses that make sense, and they're off the reservation somewhere. Okay, that means that they've lost any credibility with that juror. It's really interesting. One one technique I use actually uh, for motions uh, more than I use for trial um, that you have provided, and I've been using it since, is the restate and summarize. But it's very good for me whenever I want to file any motion uh, because I can just show my question that has restated their answer and make sure it's clear. So that way there's no ambiguity, but could you give the, the viewers just a little example of a restate and summarize just what it is? Sure. What happens is when we sit in a deposition, we'll ask a question and we'll generally get a sense of how we're doing in that deposition, including we're doing great with this one. The sense is, oh, this guy's giving me everything. We're doing great with this guy. It's <laughs> tremendous. You know, and then you look at the transcript. <laughs> And you'll have the good answer, the good stuff, but it's buried in 300 words of text, right? And so now you want to use it at trial. You know, there's this rule, is it rule 35, the rule of completeness? You know, the judge is going to want you, is, they're going to object and want you to read the entire answer or play the entire recorded response. And it's not nearly as clear if you're reading the entire recorded response that you're really getting what you thought you were getting. Restating testimony. Summarizing your saying Tesla is creating a sound bite. Right. If it isn't a sound bite, which I mean by I mean sound bite, I mean 10 seconds or less. That's what you want. So you can repeat it over and over and over like a mantra. And you won't get that from a witness in because they'll give you a great answer, but it's buried in a bunch of other crap. You restate and summarize. To make sure I understand what you're saying, Dr. So and so, you're telling us. Blah, 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 blah. Right? That's restating and summarizing. You get them to agree. Now you've got what you need for your motion. But the answer is, it's, uh, I learned about this from watching my own clients be deposed. I said, my conclusion when I was a baby lawyer was, these defense lawyers are really dumb. They just asked my witness that question five months ago. Now they're asking them again. I can't, what idiots? Don't, aren't they keeping track of what they're asking? And of course, they were restating and summarizing. So they had a sound bite that they could use for a motion. I mean, it's really smart. Uh, it, it's helped me a lot. It's also helped me with um, if I need to do any. It's really helpful, honestly, with like any deposition transcripts. Um, if I want to play the video, it's so much easier to play that, uh, especially because most of the time when someone's particularly loquacious, it's usually a paid opinion expert who's like, well, here's the answer. And it's like, you know, four paragraphs long. Well, if you repeat it, I could just use that one clip to use it later on. Um, the more and more I practice, the more and more I just try to break down my case to make it as simple, succinct as possible. I mean, you know, the goal is to have, you know, witnesses done within 20 minutes, even on the most complicated witness. But a lot easier said than done. Uh, you know, every case is a little bit different. What are you working on now? Uh, uh, well, I'll give you an example. The 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 takeaway I think for part of this is we don't win complex cases. We we win simple cases. And the more complex that you make the case, the greater the likelihood is that you're going to lose it. So the example I gave earlier, this was a, a birth trauma case, but we said, let's do a timeline. Because I, I knew what was going to happen. Uh, give me all the critical times up to the point that this baby is born and is obviously a fubar. And you know, I, I get 10 points and they really would have put more in there. Here's the critical times of what was going on. And we talked about it, talked about, we cut it down to five. With five points, we had an easy, simple communication model for jurors to understand. This is when the baby comes in. 
This is when they have a strip that shows it's a category three and the baby's at risk. This is when the, um, the C-section is ordered and this is the condition of the baby at delivery. So it's five points and the real key is they had an obviously at-risk baby two hours before they do the C-section. That's all I want the jurors to understand. Everything else is, you know, the, now the defense may want to talk about all those other points. Well, we had a meeting. By the way, they have a, they have a, a, a fetal heart rate strip that shows this baby's at risk. And they have a, a committee meeting. And I, when I, I'm going to call it a committee meeting because it's very pejorative. But they had a meeting among, you know, the head nurse, the charge nurse and one of the other nurses and a couple of doctors to talk about whether they should do the C-section or not. When the baby was at risk, you know, an hour and a half before, what are you, why are you waiting? Why are you having a committee meeting? Pull the baby. Kind of thing. So that's, that's, that's getting into the weeds, but it's what's important in the case. And so I would test this, but I, there's a possibility the thing that makes people the most angry about this case is you've got a baby that obviously is, it's not showing any movement inside the womb. It's not, there's no body movement. It looks like there's lost amniotic fluid inside the womb. Uh, they've had a, they have a critical fetal heart rate strip and they have a meeting about it. I say, I think now maybe that works. It doesn't work, but there's no medicine in that, right? The medicine would be controversial. They'll argue about the medicine all day, but they can't argue about whether this baby was at risk and they stop rather than ordering a C-section and going right to it, they stop and have a meeting. I mean, all five points at a timeline, you wonder, why aren't you moving? Why aren't you moving this? Why aren't you moving this? And it's very, very simple. Based on once you get it in through the testimony, I mean, it's, it's a very clean case, very simple case in what is actually a very extremely complex medical malpractice case. You know, it's the reason why, you know, most attorneys, I'm speaking, you know, a little biased for Texas. Don't do medical malpractice because, in terms of knowledge, skills, and experience, it's very, very high up here. You've got to know exactly um, the type of injury and how it occurs from doctor's standpoint, how they can treat it. And to take all that, that knowledge, first to learn that, then take it and break it down so a jury could understand it. It's very tough, but I think a simple timeline of what you just did is perfect. It's perfect. It's a very simple way to do that. So you've taken something complex and you made it a simple case. It's fantastic. Right. It's five points as opposed to 11 or 12 or 13. Right. Is, you know, the, and the other thing is, the let's talk about experts. Yeah. I mean, in terms of strategy, and this includes strategy for depositions, most people think, well, their expert said this, their expert said this. And the answer is, you can't make your depositions, your case about what experts say. They're a tremendous resource. They can give you insights as to what to do with the other side. But at the end of the day, the most important role of experts is getting you past a motion for summary judgment. Number one, you have to have, if you have to have experts to get past the motion for summary judgment, then you need experts. And, and maybe you need that testimony at trial to get you past the motion for directed verdict. At that point, the role is over with, right? They're done. Now it's in the jury's hands. Now, what is the jury going to think the case is about? If they think it's about what the experts said, there's experts on the other side that contradict everything they say. So it's got to be a simple case. We had to have an expert to get past the motion for summary judgment. We had to have an expert to get past the motion for directed verdict. But now the jury says, this is what the case is about. Yeah. It's not, it's nine times out of 10, it's not be what the expert says. So what is your strategy for telling them the story of what the case is about? in a way that they are motivated to return a verdict. That's what you need to be thinking about when you're taking a deposition. What is the case really about? What about this case is going to motivate people to really act for you in a deliberation? And it needs to be done at every step of the way, right? I mean, yeah. 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 And if you're not thinking about the deposition, well, why are you taking the deposition? If it's not going to, because that's, that's what it's about. The, the entire, your entire case strategy is embedded in the depositions you take. Otherwise, you're not going to have anything at trial. You know, I, I think people like you and, and people like, for example, David Ball uh, are the ones that have created, changed the narrative of, you know, moving the, the needle in terms of just check check boxes uh, for both the plaintiff and defense side to actually actively creating risk for the defense by sitting with these witnesses, getting this prepared and uh, doing just that, that, that mindset, right? Instead of 
you know, I'm going to do this, this. No, I need to exhaust the witness. I need to uh, look and, and work on these techniques and get exactly what I want for trial and deal with these experts, just like you said, that we're both going to have them. They're going to cancel out. What in this deposition can I do that would get 12 people later on to push for me? And I mean, I think that's changed it. I think the, the idea of quote unquote nuclear verdicts that everybody talks about, and we can talk about this off air, um, but the, the idea of nuclear versions is unrealistic. It's it's just that we on the plaintiff side, because of people like you have stopped doing the check mark situation, started actively litigating these cases in the correct way and telling our clients facts through these techniques. Right. Um, right. And it's 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 remarkably simple. The problem is is in some way we have to get out of our lawyer head, you know, and and not talk about um, hypoxia, for example. Now you have to teach the jurors what hypoxia means, right? As opposed to the baby's not getting enough air to breathe or the, 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 the loss of oxygen to this baby is going to cause brain damage, is causing brain damage. I mean, it's gotta, we gotta, we gotta use simple language. We gotta figure out what's important in the case and what's important in the case. And it's not everything that you find in the medical records. And it's not everything that the experts talk about either. But you know, ultimately, we have to leave ourselves and talk to other people. That's where focus groups and surveys come in is what's important to them. Because all of a sudden it's like something that you didn't think was that important. They think is very important. So I did some focus groups in, uh, in Florida this last weekend. And it was, uh, happened to be a nursing home case, but, uh, what the, what was initially thought to be really, really important fact in the case was they had, they had dropped this man and dislocated his hip. He just had, he was in the rehab. He just, but what was really important in the case was, I mean, that's what I, it sounded like a pretty big deal to me. It sounds like a pretty big deal to me too. Deal. <laughs> yeah. But the most, the most, the most compelling fact of the jury was the fact that this facility was grossly understaffed. Huh. Okay. That was the most important thing to them and explained everything else. I mean, the reason they dropped him, it was, it was, there's only one person in there helping him. Couldn't handle him because he was too heavy and they were too light. You know, and then there's other things, but everything, everything came back to the fact that they were grossly understaffed. So what is the case about? Is it about dropping the person in the bathroom and then dislocating the hip? No, it was about being them understaffed. And everything that happened to this man was a function of that be, of being understaffed. And so that's, when we talked to regular people, they came to a different perspective. And listening to these people, I, I think they're right. But it's not naturally where we would have gone. We would have gone to the drop, which, which by the way, they didn't disclose to the family. Oh wow, which, which is which is bad. Wow, but okay. the fact is, it's it's it was all about the understaffing. That's what drove um, the jury's deliberation. Now we did it again. Maybe we had a different result, but the fact we just did it a couple times and we got a different perspective on the case from what we thought it was. So, what do we want to make the case about now? I probably don't want to make I mean, uh, the drop uh, gets mentioned, but it's not about the drop. The drop is an effect, right? And the causes the, yeah. uh, the understaffing, and it you drive that, especially when you show it's a you know, I'm sure you're going to show the how much they're making every year and what they're doing, why they have chosen to be understaffed. I agreed. Uh, I, I think you get a jury to go with you 110 percent of the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so they, the other thing they say is we don't want to overprove our cases. For example, when people, this is a case of uh, oh, what's it, the money over. Money over lives, money over lives, kind of stuff. Yeah, I hate that shit. Yeah, it's so. just, it's just, it doesn't. It's like, like, can't you come up with something that's more specific to the case, more original lives? Yeah, you know, uh, that, that drive because I want, I want them the facts, the case to drive whatever comes out of your mouth. So money over lives, you might have a case, but but people just use that because it's a buzzword. What really applies to my case is say, well, how so? I'd rather say that. Their turnover was 150% in the six months prior to this. They had no training of their new employees. And most of the new employees had no training before coming to that facility. I mean, I'd rather say that. Because people on their own, jurors can come up with their own, you know, profits over lives. They can come up with that without us saying it. Yeah. Just, just give them the facts that allow them to go there. Lead them there. 
<laughs> but yeah, it's all, it's all about thinking about the case and not just reflexively putting in a buzzword or saying, can you give me an outline of a safety director's deposition? No, 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 no. You've got to have your own outline for your case, the facts of the case, what your strategy is, because that deposition is going to change completely. If there's, for example, a driver driver view camera in the cab, right? That's a different deposition than a case where there isn't a driver view camera. This is a simple example, because that ends up driving all kinds of stuff in questions you never would have asked otherwise. No, that's that's exactly right. Um, it's what I'm getting from you, and I 100% and I agree, is that you cannot go into these things thinking there's some form that you're going to rely on. These forms are helpful. They're helpful for brainstorming. They're helpful for kind of figuring out, look, I've seen other attorneys do X, Y, and Z that I've liked. What did, how did they get there? But at the end of the day, every case is a little different. Every attorney is a little different. Not only the way that our cadence, the way that we do things, the way that we do discovery, the way that we do our depositions. So at the end of the day, you can seek guidance. I mean, I'm on TTLA, TTLA Texas Travelers, Lifters all day. I seek guidance all day. But if, if it's going to be my case and I want to sit with this witness, I've got to put, you know, X amount of hours per deposition to feel comfortable with this case, putting on the facts and the complexity. Um, right. And another thing you need to do is buy your book. <laughs> but uh, and, so, and so that I, that I have this buzzword I use sometimes, which is, you want to change the defendant's perception of risk with your deposition. So the question is, how are you doing that? What are you doing in this deposition that's going to change their perception of risk uh, of going to trial with you or lowballing you in the mediation? Uh, and and then what is there? I mean, the answer is maybe you can't come up with anything, but you should think about it. Can we come up with something that's going to change their perception of risk? How do we do that? And as opposed to what questions can I ask? It should be about the strategy and the outcome and not the, I want to ask him about where you're standing. Okay, well, you probably need to ask that, but, you know, anybody can do that. What else can you do? Yeah. Yeah. So and, and I can, let me make a comment about experts. So people who depose experts at the advanced deposition college, when they start talking about deposing experts, I'm saying, why are you deposing the experts? You, they have a, in most states, and certainly in federal court, they have a disclosure requirement for what their opinions are, the basis of their opinions, the number of times they've testified in the past, all that kind of stuff. Why are you deposing? And uh, the answer is, well, because everybody does it or because I want to blah, blah, blah. The answer is, there, there's case law that if you depose an expert who has an obligation, and as most of them do, to make Rule 26 disclosures, what you've done by deposing them is open the door for their testimony at trial, where they now can testify about anything because you exercise their right to depose them. I'd rather restrict them to the four corners of the report and cross them on that than to go in there, they get to hear me, they get to see me, they get to figure out, okay, I got this guy, I understand him. If you're an unknown quantity, you're more of a threat than if you paid them to depose them. And oh, by the way, once you depose them, they can probably say anything they want and you can't stop them because you can't restrict them to the report now. Hmm. So that's, that's a little something to think about. In fact, I've got a, a Texas lawyer named Steve Laird. who's practiced, I don't know, 28 years. He used to do nothing but medical malpractice. Now he does a bunch of trucking. But he told me in, when I met with him in January, he had only deposed three experts in his entire career. Wow. Okay. <laughs> it's so, only eight so, years. That's that's yeah. A, so 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 he, he he's a he's a you know he's an ABOTA member. He's a board certified civil trial advocate. He's board certified in medical. It's like, why is he not deposing? Why am I deposing these experts? He doesn't. The answer is because there's no advantage to him in deposing the expert. So that if you're going to depose, an, there's reasons to depose experts, but they better be good reasons. Like. I want to depose this expert so I can exclude his testimony. That's a good reason to depose an expert. So that, that's basically a Daubert style examination. Right. Other than that, unless you've got something, unless they're a convicted felon and have been 
lost their license repeatedly or something, you know, I probably don't want, I want to save everything for cross at trial unless I can get the judge to rule that they're not allowed to testify at all, or at least at all on one or two subjects. That's a, that would be a Daubert type of examination. But other than that, you've got to ask yourself strategically, what does this deposing expert do for me in the case? And I think people kind of don't think through that. They depose experts and incur thousands of dollars of cost. They really shouldn't. My, uh, my issue with deposing a lot of experts or deposing a lot of defense experts primarily is that I'm actually not moving my case. I have the burden. So I'm maybe I can break them down certain things that may help during mediation. Um, but uh, realistically, it's not helping with my burden of proof. I'd rather work on that because that's what I got to show at trial. That's what's going to move the checklist that we talk about with the insurance company more than anything. Um, so I don't, I don't disagree with you, but I will tell you this, this year alone, I think I'm taking more than three, <laughs> significantly more. So, uh, that's interesting. It's something I'm definitely going to think about coming out of this. I should write it down. Yeah. Write it down. Well, Steve Laird, Steve Laird is the guy I'm talking about. He's a great lawyer. He's in, uh, Fort Worth. Good guy, but it's like, you know, he'll tell you, I think, it's, I think it's three. I, I don't think I'm understating it or overstating it. Three. It doesn't take them. So what are you what are you doing now? I know you do cases across the country. Is there any limit on what type of case you'll take? Or they're almost always personal injury cases. Um, I've got I've done everything from um, systemic child sexual abuse. Oh wow! Where you're suing a, you know some sort of governmental entity. Yeah. Those are big crazy cases. I've got a, a human trafficking case, which is a little unusual, involving a an entertainer who basically groomed young girls and then, you know, obviously had sexual intercourse with them and had a relationship with them, had them send naked pictures of themselves to him. That's kind of an unusual off the wall case. Uh, but the majority of my cases um, are, are the cases that I'm working on that are other people's cases. And that r- runs the range from medical malcrisis practice to trucking to industrial accidents to all kinds of stuff. And the problems are always different in every one of them. So uh, I working, I have an industrial accident case with someone and there's 40 witnesses and, you know, uh, I don't know how many experts, over a dozen different experts. Uh, and it's a real, there's five different plaintiffs. So it ends up in one of those cases, it's just got a lot of things going in every direction. But So that's very different. And the typical case, in a typical case, most of us have, maybe you have a dozen depositions. But that's usually the most that I typically see in deposition, as opposed to one where you have 30, 40, 50 cases. And then I worked on uh, a friend of mine had a stand up role in the Invisible Chemicals case, uh, which is the uh, has to do with firefighters foam and this chemical called PFFF, which gets into the uh, aquifer and you can't get rid of it. It's a known carcinogen, et cetera, et cetera. Very interesting case, huge case. And they, I think they sell the case. I worked on for 1.2 billion, Whew. and I had, I had a very small, I had a very small role in the case, but just dealing with, um, I was dealing with direct examination of two experts, is what I worked on, and the tough part is, you know, the you, you want to make their testimony simple, and it's not in their nature, expert, it's not in the nature of most experts to make their their, their testimony simple. And the other thing is, they think what they have to say is the most important thing in the case. <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> and, and, and they can't they can't leave out any detail. And so yeah. these guys have report. I mean, it's just so getting that under control in a way. It's like they send you a PowerPoint. And it's got 230 slides. This is my direct examination. You got to. Yeah. Go. This no, is not going to work. It's not going to work. <laughs> so that, that, that's an example of something that's a little different than something that I did, which is like just dealing with an expert in a big case like that, where they, they think their case is it's so important that they know all of these facts. Uh, and, you know, you couldn't possibly keep the jury awake for all of those facts. Yeah. And, and I, think, I think they have this kind of mindset or this ego mindset, for lack of a better term, in that the more complex they have something, the more it seems like they, the expert, are is the, like the, the smartest person in the room. They should listen to them. And the reality is, if you take something very complex and make it very simple, 
that is where, where the real work starts, right? Yeah, that's our job. Yeah. That's our job. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, uh, do you do any consulting or anything with, with other lawyers? Yeah, about 80% of my time I'm working with other lawyers uh, on cases. So, I mean, the answer is I have four open files um, and um, one of them's in federal court, one's in a death, court, death case in state court. And the other two are just, you know, one of them's a trucking case that hasn't been litigated, hasn't been filed yet. The other one's just a, a collision case that hasn't been filed yet. So I've got four open files and I really don't want any more open files <laughs> <laughs> because I'm, I've got enough to do with these other people. These are really big cases with catastrophic injuries, really interesting. And I like working on my own files, but it's, uh, I've got to the point where I, I get more enjoyment out of working on someone else's cases where I know it's going to make a difference in what should be a, an eight figure verdict anyway. Yeah. That's a lot. Of, that's a lot of fun. Yeah. Or going, I mean, I'm going to, I do, I run observer jurors on cases going to trial. So I've got a, a number of cases now where I'm going to go out of, out of state for a week or more and run an observer jury in the background to find out what they're thinking and feeling about the testimony, where they under, understood what the lawyers are saying, where, which way they're leaning in terms of, a witness's credibility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so it's, that ends up sucking up a lot of time. But it's really interesting work. And I get to to talk to people that are potentially could be not, who are not on the jury. Right. But they're, by and large, they're pretty much like the people on the jury. And what they say, if they didn't understand something, the odds are somebody on the jury didn't understand it either. Yeah. Identifying that while you still have the time to bring somebody else up or recall a witness is really important. If someone wanted to work on a case with you, how would they get in contact with you? Uh, you know, the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, my name is Philip Miller. You can find me on the yeah. internet. And I guess you can post my email address, yeah. which is pmiller at seriousinjury.com. pmiller at seriousinjury.com. That's the easiest way. Just send me an email. Yeah. Uh, my cell phone number is 615-394-7300. That's easy, too. But the answer is... You know, I work all the time. I work, you know, seven days a week, pretty much. I don't work 10 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah. But I, I, there's never a, a significant period of time, really, where I'm not working. I'm not looking at my cell phone. I'm not checking my email, right. et cetera. So I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. The problem is always calendar, rec reconciling calendars. Yeah. That's the tough part. Getting a hold of me is easy. Being able to reconcile <laughs> calendars is more difficult. And then, you know, you have to... I mean, I'm like anybody else you're going to hire. I'm, I'm, I, I pride myself on not being the cheapest consultant you can hire. I don't want to be the cheapest consultant you can hire. And I'm not. Uh, but if it's, a, if, it's a, you know, if it's a good case and you're going, to make a, you're going to make enough money to change the arc of a family or of an individual, then you probably can afford to hire me. Uh, but, you know, for example, I, I, other kinds of cases, I'm interested in them. But it's, I, you know, I only have so many hours in a day and so many hours in a week and probably can't afford to work on a case that's got a lower return. Just just can't afford to do it because it blocks me out from doing something on a case that can make a bigger difference to someone. Yes, um, and I, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you doing this and I appreciate you writing this book. It's, it's really helped me in my career. And, uh, you know, for our viewers, the book also has like a CD portion, which I thought was super cool. I didn't even, I was like, ah, whatever. Uh, after I went through it once and then I was like, oh, let me look at a couple of these techniques and work on it for this one deposition. I was like, let me see what the CD is. And it was just so helpful for me to have a visualization. Um, so it was, it was, well, not a visualization, but just hearing what you were doing, and how it was going, it was really helpful for me. But anyways, um, one last question I ask everybody is if, uh, if you give a young attorney just one piece of advice, what would it be? Go out of state for your continuing legal education. So, I mean, there's a tendency, like, I'm going to go to my local bar association for my CLE hours, or I'm going to go to my, at the state level, I'll go to the Tennessee or the Texas trial lawyers or whatever it happens to be. And the problem is, is it ends up being a pretty small world in your, if, whether you're, even if you're in Dallas or Houston, which are huge cities, or you're in Texas, which is a huge state, you need to leave to hear what other people are saying and doing, because people are not doing things the same way as you are in Texas. Some of the things you're doing in Texas are great. People need to copy it. But there's some, th some things that people do in Ohio that you don't know anything about. 
And so going out of state exposes you to more different ideas as opposed to the same idea repeated by the same 10 people. Yeah, I 100% so, agree. I agree. And I know that you're working with uh, Dan Ambrose with the TLU University, right? And kind of doing stuff with him. I went to the one in Vegas. Um, I think it was, I don't know, it was last year sometime. But it was fantastic. It was fantastic. I, saw, I got to meet attorneys from across the nation and see how they do different things. It was great. They had like these breakout sessions. They had the great sessions. And I mean, even people like uh, Jason Aiken pick juries live. So you're right. I think uh, more of us need to go out of state and get the experience. I haven't been to AAJ's advanced depositions still, so I'm going to look into that after speaking with you. <laughs> I can tell you, it's, it's Martin Luther King weekend in January every year, which is January, mid-January. So I think it starts on the uh, 12th, 14th of January this year. But it's always MLK weekend. Uh, and then TLU, I'm teaching at TLU in New York in September, which I'll be doing a, a sec, I'm doing a day on advanced deposition strategy and techniques. I'll be doing a day on that. And then I'm Speaking with Satch Oliver on, on a couple of times. Anyway, if you don't know Satch Oliver, he's a he's a former attendee of the Advanced Deposition College and now is a regular faculty member. And he's a he's just he's he's a great lawyer, but he's just an, he's a different kind of lawyer than you're used to seeing. I mean, he went to college on a rodeo scholarship. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's what okay. the college on, on a rodeo scholarship. <laughs> all of a sudden, like, who is this guy? Uh, and he's, a, he's a real character, but it's just a really nice guy. He's, a, he's like someone you could say is the nicest guy in the courtroom. And he really is. But he is an ass kicker when it comes to depositions in this country. So, so, I'm, I'm, he's, so he's presenting. I'll be presenting with him while I'm in New York at TLU. And it's a, there's a, there's a, for example, I have a, an approach to cross that I'm not sure is, is fits my personality. But there's one of the faculty members on, at TLU in New York is a New York lawyer. He's got a great template or, or approach to cross-examination. And it's really good. But he is very aggressive. And I'd say, this guy's kind of an asshole. <laughs> you know, but he's, he's got this great cross-examination technique. So if you want to learn how to cross-examine like a New York lawyer, you should go to, you should go to TLU in September. Because you'll be able to see it. It's going to be a bunch of New York lawyers there. And now, while, quite frankly, they hardly ever leave New York, you know. But so it, they, they may be all saying the same things. But if you never go York, New York, you're never going to hear them. That's right. And so it's a great opportunity to hear how a different group of people do exactly the same thing that you do. And some of it's really good. Some of it's not so good. But the cross-examination like a New York lawyer, that's something to think about. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very curious. I'm also very curious about how you get onto a rodeo scholarship, but I'm going to have to Google that after this. <laughs> you, 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 got, you got a ride and rope, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> well, Philip, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate the time. I'm going to put the uh, link to your, to your book uh, here in the show notes, as well as your email in case anyone gets in contact with you. And um, I may also put if, if it's up already, the AAJ, um, uh, if that's 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 just, yeah, the, the link for it and see if, and see yeah. if, you know, put well, it oh, and put, put, put the TLU in New York. Yes. In, yeah. Doing a day there. yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Good to see you.